Good evening, everybody. Um, I thought there was going to, somebody going to say something before I started talking, but uh, I would like to uh, welcome everybody here. Um, say thanks to Louise for asking me. Um, congratulations on a masterpiece. Um, I'm going to be doing a few songs. Yes, give her a round of applause. There's a, a playlist associated um, with the book that uh, the book is it's kind of like a time machine and these songs are also like time machines taking us back to that place. Um, this song was written by uh, Dominic Behan and um, I suppose it started its life as a, as a rebel song but um, I think it's more a, a peace song and, and the, it tells of the, uh, how easy it is to become uh, embroiled in, in a war that isn't of your own making, uh, just through other people's pain and anguish. Uh, so, the Patriot game. <laughs>
gentlemen, uh, my name is Donald Tinney, I'm the County Librarian in Sligo, and I'd like to welcome you all here to the April 2022 version of The Word, a special event. I'd like to welcome also our online viewers, um, many of which uh, follow us every month. Now, I'd just like to say tonight is a special night because, for a certain reason, that is our former colleague, Louise Kennedy's debut novel has been launched here this evening, and it is a great pleasure and a delight. It's nearly part of her family making a success. She is a, a wonderful person when she was working here. When I saw her, her book, um, the, uh, the End of the World is a cul-de-sac, a sort of tour de force in short storytelling. And I was thinking of a former librarian here many moons ago by the name of Frank O'Connor sprung to mind. She's absolutely talented in the terms of short story. But anyway, tonight we have uh, a special event to celebrate that. But I'd just like to introduce tonight's event as well, and that is to thank Cathy for her opening rendition of the Patriot Game, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, Cathy will provide music interludes throughout the evening, and I think a more fitting person I couldn't think of myself either, and in terms of her fame uh, throughout the music world, I don't think she needs any mention because she, her reputation precedes her in every way, but she did work with us uh, years ago when we were trying to put together a tourist trail for Yates where she did a rendition uniquely and for free of the Sally Garden and I think it's, it's to stands to this day as the best version in my humble opinion of Stand by the Sally Garden. She's a fantastic voice which is a natural and uh, the fact is that she did it for free along with Dervish. I thought it was fitting that her public service element as well as renowned community <laughs> service. So we're back again. That was many moons ago. But anyway, uh, also we have three parts tonight. We have the music, we have the book launch, and we have the interview with um, Susan McKay, our writer in residence. And as uh, Susan was here last month and it was a tremendous success, particularly online with over 500 people watching it, uh, with Fergal Keane, the interview. I hope that you get a chance to see it. If you haven't seen it, it was fantastic. People were wanting more, which is a great way to leave an audience. But Susan is our writer in residence, part of our decade of centenary, 1913-1923, and a more fitting writer in residence I don't think we could get. She's a renowned journalist, uh, documentary, makers of do famous documentaries, and a commentator of society, and uh, I think she's fantastic as well. So we look forward to uh, Susan interviewing Louise as well. And last, and last but not least, uh, this evening as well, this is the word, and it is an opportunity, and fair play to them for those who want to take to the open mic. Uh, our hats off to people who are willing to put their work uh, into the public domain. I think that it's to their credit that every time they come up here and do a performance, it's fantastic as well. And that's the main success as well of the word, is that we're getting new talent all the time. Uh, to just introduce Louise, as I said, she's worked as a chef for over 30 years, I see in the blurb of her book. And when I'm reading this instance, my goodness, what a talent was hidden there. I mean, if you enjoyed the end of the world as a cul-de-sac, the trespass is really is a tour de force. I couldn't agree more with what Cassie was saying. It's a tour de force. It's, it's a fantastic read, real page turn, real storytelling at its best. And I'd just like you to sit back now and enjoy the evening. And that's what we're here to do, to celebrate literature and music and culture in general. So enjoy, and I wish you a good evening. Thanks. <laughs> So thank you so much, Donal, and thanks so much, Cathy. I think Cathy's song really sort of set us into the right tone for the evening because this novel by Louise, which we're celebrating tonight, is very much about the sorrows of our country as well as celebrating the love that can exist and the hope that can exist within our country. It is about tragedy as well. Um, so it's, and it's obvious from what Donal has said that all good things start in Sligo Library. So we've got, <laughs> so we've got that established. And actually, um, when I, I was talking with Patricia Keane, uh, one of the other librarians here um, before, and she talked about how proud they all were about the fact that Louise was having her launch here tonight because she was such a great colleague, but also, she said, a natural and gifted storyteller long before she decided she was going to be a writer. So they did know you were gifted even before you finally um, put pen to paper, Louise. 
So it's a huge honour to, to launch this extraordinary um, novel here in Sligo this evening, and particularly in the library where, as has been mentioned, Louise worked before among all the other many brilliant books that are held in this great institution. Um, I've, I'm a, I feel that I'm an old friend of Louise's, which is very strange because we only actually met uh, initially online um, during lockdown and uh, we haven't really known each other for a very long time. We only actually met, I think, uh, a year ago, but I had read The End of the World is a cul-de-sac and had been absolutely ravaged and astonished by, by the power of it. But I have to admit that at a personal level, I was first drawn to her by her scabrous and frankly filthy Twitter stream, <laughs> and which saw me through many sleepless nights uh, during, during lockdown, as it did indeed many thousands of others, many of whom will not be willing to declare themselves to be fans of that particular aspect of your imagination. But um, I think that it would probably be true to say that when we actually met a year ago, we, we bonded over our obsession with the North, really, and with the, the, its, its sorrows and its difficulties and its conflict, but also with the fact that it is a kind of magnificent place in which there are certain types of freedom that it is hard to discern in, in other less troubled places, I think. I think that Louise has a very powerfully northern sensibility and it didn't surprise me to read that she had uh, talked about how she had um, tr sort of found when she was exiled as a child with her family to the, the, the Republic, to the South, the state, as we still call it in the North, um, that uh, she, she changed her accent, but that when she got back into writing again, she discovered that she wrote with a Northern accent. And I think she really does write with a Northern accent. She writes with a Northern way of, of perceiving the world. And it kind of, when I was thinking about it, when I was preparing for this evening, it made me think about um, a poem that I love by the Northern poet John Hewitt, where he talks about, he was, he was exiled also, and he talked about, um, like Lear's children banished to the waters, our hearts still listen for the landward bells. And I think there's that, there's that in Louise, there's, there's a listening there for intimations of the North, and she has a very acute sense of borders, and a border mind, I think, that sees things shifting all the time and moving, and not in terms of lines, but of, but of strange places that may not immediately be recognised. But in making, she's made a return to the North. Um, I love the description of her as, which you see sometimes as um, the, 55, the 54 year old former chef, because as a former journalist, a news journalist, it seems to me that it sounds like a real criminal, a really good beginning of a criminal <laughs> sort of a story, <laughs> news story. You know, the 54 year old uh, former chef admitted that she had <laughs> dot, dot, dot. But um, she's, she has returned to the North as a writer. She did a, a PhD in, in Queens in, in a very short period of time. She's one of the few people I've ever known who did a PhD without sort of talking about the agonies of it for about a decade before finally giving it up. Um, anyway, we have had much late night cackling together since we actually uh, started to see each other. And uh, I was so pleased and delighted when she, she um, asked me to launch the book tonight. I mean, the reviews have been absolutely astonishing for this novel. Cathy chose the word masterpiece, and that's the word that's been chosen by many, including uh, other notable Northern writers like Lucy Caldwell, Gail McConnell, and Glenn Patterson, all of whom chose that word masterpiece. Um, just to mention a couple of the reviews, The Stinging Fly, which is a, a really esteemed literary magazine, described it as witty, mordant, and necessary. Um, to my mind, one of the most sensitive reviews was in the Irish Times by Nicholas Allen, and he compared her with Anna Burns' Milkman, and nobody gets compared with Anna Burns. You know, she, Anna Burns is in a class of her own, but I don't think it was uh, the wrong thing to do. And he talked about how he saw in both of their work a turn in Northern fiction towards freedoms that are the preserve of the highest works of art. And that sort of gives me a shiver in the spine because it is true of this work and it's of course true of, of Anna Burns's Milkman as well. Uh, he described her as a writer of exceptional empathy, style and skill. 
Uh, Kevin Power spoke about her rare sense of utter conviction. Every page, he said, felt like a, a moral and intellectual event, and he spoke of her passion, poise, and mastery. So, in other words, in a writer who comes so garlanded, what exactly is there to like? <laughs> well, I think the fact that after a weekend of such reviews, she wrote on Twitter, so far up my own backside, I forgot to take my meds. <laughs> Um, and the fact that she genuinely is so modest about her extraordinary achievements and talent, and also so generous in her praise for and support for fellow writers. Um, I think she's one of those writers who genuinely doesn't have a massive ego. She has a huge commitment to her work and a huge joy in writing and in sharing uh, the exploration of writing with other people who care about it. There's a real truth and, and, and beauty there. And I think that's shown in the kind of range of people who have liked the book. You know, she's had rave reviews in Good Housekeeping as well as in places like the Times Literary Supplement. You know, she's, she's one of those writers who couldn't be described as being a literary writer or a popular writer because she's both. And that is actually quite a rare thing um, she asked me to read an early version of the book uh, because as a, as a news journalist I would be able to sort of talk to her about the authenticity of the thing in, in terms of um, the troubles and I'm happy to say that she disregarded some of my more sweeping advice, <laughs> like you'll have to get rid of that character, it's too obvious, you know, and uh, then she sort of said nervously, well, but if I do that the whole scaffolding of the novel is going to fall down, so... Well, all right, I said, <laughs> and, she, and she left it as it was. But it really was uh, fantastic to see this book take shape, and, and she has gone through so many drafts of it at this stage, but it still reads like a really fresh, brilliant, new thing, and um, I just can't, can't praise it highly enough. So after all that, you will expect me to start slagging you Slag mercilessly, yeah. but I don't intend to. Uh, I want you to talk to people tonight about how you, how you wrote this book and, and how you came to be a, the writer that you are in a remarkably short time. I mean, you only started really seriously writing a few years ago and now you've got, I mean, we haven't talked about the success of The End of the World was a cul-de-sac, but it was incredibly successful. It was on the end of the year lists of virtually every literary person who was asked to, you know, give their favourite books of the year. So, do you, do you now feel that you are a writer? You are. This is this is what you are. You're Louise Kennedy, writer. Um, oh God, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I probably am. I don't know if I feel that. I, I don't really feel that. But you um, do it. Well, it's what you do. Yeah, I do. As I go on Twitter, and I call myself a writer, and I go through <laughs> all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think um, there's a huge amount of luck involved as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and I don't know if I really believe in talent as an idea. Um, I just don't know if I believe in it because you just have to turn up and do the work mm -hmm. all the time, whether you feel like it or not or something. Um, but with regards to uh, how I started with Neve McCabe, is there Neve was asked to join um, a writing group in January 2014, wasn't it? By um, by um, Una and um, Rose Jordan, who, who were setting one up. And the plan was, I think, um, to meet in Sligo IT every Monday night. And I didn't really, I, 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 don't, I still don't know why Neve asked me, but uh, she was very persuasive. And after I said no a few times, I got into the car with her. And it was, I've said, I've told the story about 27,000 times, um, but it was very embarrassing because everybody else had, um, I don't know, had been involved in some sort of creative practice or had been trying to write. And I was just, some EGD chef who was up there, I don't know why, uh, really, um, just out of curiosity or something. Um, and we, we came up with a, a rosa or something, and I, uh, I think I had five weeks to write a short story. And um, I don't know, I just felt that something tilted in me as soon as I sat down, that I just really didn't want to do anything else. And, um, and then after that, it was just a matter of trying to fit it in between all the other things that I was trying to do, like in the middle of the night or um, um, on lunch breaks or, or whenever. Yeah. Well, it seems like there was a, a natural progression then towards writing a novel, wasn't there? Because I saw somewhere that you spoke about having one of the stories that was actually published in the book as, I think, 
5,000 words had started out at something like 60, you know, yeah. something incredible. No, that happened. So, so like, um, I think I wrote 43,000 words or something like that. And mm -hmm. I, I just checked this because I, I was trying to, I, I was preparing for a writing workshop with, um, with other writers and it was about editing just to try and show that sometimes you just have to write and write and write and write before you can find anything in it, or, or I do. And um, so I think I wrote something like 43,000 words between all of these different um, points of view and characters from, you know, um, and tenses and everything. Um, and I ended up with um, two stories that were arranged 5,000 words each. Um, but the most ridiculous was probably Garland Sunday, which is the last story in the collection. And I wrote over 60,000 words to end up with like eight or nine. Um, but that was a form of madness. Like I just should have stopped. But I was at that for 13 months. And the more I wrote, the more I just felt that I, I couldn't bear to like abandon it because it was a complete and utter waste mm. of time. And I had to try and... <laughs> Um, find a way to make it work, but um, but that actually should have been a novel. Like I was trying to stuff a, a novel into a, a short story, and um, I couldn't. And that's what what the problem was. But at that time, I wasn't thinking of writing novels at all. I just thought I'll just keep writing short stories. And I think then um, I, also something else that happened in the writing group. Like, do you remember in the very first year, Una, you went to London to read at something, and you came back with um, a copy of the NaNoWriMo handbook. Do you remember that? And then that November, um, it was decided that we're all going to do like NaNoWriMo, which is like, you're going to write a novel in a month. And uh, I was doing it every day, and I thought everybody else was. And I was the only agent who was getting up in the middle of the night. And I ended up with 51,000 <laughs> words or something of this uh, story. And it was really very dreadful, dreadful. But, um, but I think I had maybe fleshed out some ideas. Um, like it was set in the north and um, there was a character who's probably a bit like Michael Agnew in it. And there was a cushlet, but actually Michael Agnew had had a relationship with her mother. And, um, and it was very Mills and Boone, like really very kind of <laughs> Mills and Boone, uh, like romantic fiction or something. Um, so um, I didn't do anything with that, but I think that, and I didn't really think about it after that, but um, I think maybe in, in, in that month, I probably figured out what the story wasn't gonna be about or something. And then afterwards, um, I suppose Trespasses came out of, um, when I was doing the MA in Queens, we were asked to go into the, the there was a life writing module that we did, and, um, where we had to write like something the length of an article, like 8,000 words a week. And um, one week um, we were asked to go into the Ulster Museum to uh, choose a piece of art or something, and, um, or to some kind of exhibit and write about it. And, um, I chose something that had been in the Art of the Troubles um, exhibition um, that I wrote about that, or just wrote about it generally, um, and just about how, um, do you remember that exhibition and how? Mm -hmm. um, it was a brilliant exhibition. It was brilliant, yeah. but I remember at the time, um, because these things never make everybody happy, that some people felt that it had gone too far and other people felt it hadn't gone far enough. Um, and I think it just made me think about um, how maybe um, things that are unsayable could be represented in other ways or something. Um, so I wrote this thing that was maybe 800 words and actually a couple of, maybe a couple of paragraphs of that or word for word um, ended up in the prologue to, to the novel. And there is, there's a character who sort of, there's a relationship, a, a, a sort of a, a thing that happens between two people in one of the stories mm -hmm. that, that is like the beginning of the relationship between Michael and oh, in Crucial, Silhouette, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that was totally like a man walks into a bar mm -hmm. thing. And I guess it is about, um, maybe about obsession and about the troubles. And, mm -hmm. it, and it, it did have that 1970s kind of bar setting mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, the 70s is, I, I can't remember, you, you quoted... Um, you quoted a poet called Martina Evans uh, talking about my hot place yeah. for writing and yeah. that for you it seems to be 1970s yeah. Belfast. Mm -hmm. But you were actually very young when you left... Yeah, North, so I was you? Yeah, so you? I was 12 when we left, so that was 1979. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that things, a few specific things happened um, when I was a, a child that or I have a very good memory. I can remember things that happened when I apparently was two, but I, mm -hmm. I didn't know I was two until I, you know, until I checked with my parents and they said, oh, you would have been like very young. But I remember things very clearly. Um, and uh, w one thing that I do remember very clearly um, and I remember all the months around it was, um, so we had a pub in Hollywood and um, it was run by my granny. And one day she was on her way to the bank to make a lodgement. So this was, um, I think March, 1971. And um, she, as she was walking past a, a different pub in the town, somebody had planted a bomb in the window and it exploded. And she had like hundreds of stitches, like really quite um, horrific injuries. And I remember that really distinctly. Um, and I've said this before, that people think their children don't no, 
what's going on, but they really do um, understand things and pick up on kind of stress or tensions in the house. And I remember um, all of the talk about that at the time. And I remember when she came out of hospital and stuff, um, she had very, the, the, the stitches were very crude, crude and, and, and stuff. And I remember, um, I just remember like really distinctive details from then that um, I overheard her say one day that every, this was maybe six months later, that every time she washed her hair, little tiny splinters of glass were working their way out of her scalp uh, and things like that. Um, um, so, so I remember that very clearly. I remember um, other things. There, there's another thing that I, I think it was a memory, but I'm not sure if it was a memory. And it was that um, in a house that we lived in when I was maybe four, maybe five, so it was probably 1972, um, we had, uh, uh, there was a neighbour who, who lived around the corner. And um, I think it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes if you hear this story in your childhood often enough, you start to think you were there or, or something. So I'm not sure if I was there. I think I might have been there. Um, but my um, my memory of it is standing on, is of standing on the driveway and um, having got out of the car and my mother locking the car up and a fella across the road who I, I would have kind of known um, calling at her, oh, you're not talking to me, Brenda? Um, and um, she said, oh, I didn't see you there. And about two days later, his body was found on, on waste ground where he had been um, abducted and became separated from his friends on a night out in East Belfast. And... Um, and, and he was killed, so he'd been tortured in one of those romper rooms. So um, I was certainly brought up with that story, and I, I think I was there. Mm -hmm. I think I was there. Um, and then, th then there were the bombs in our pub. I remember that all very distinctly as well. So it obviously was a haunting experience. Yeah, I think it was. Ways. But at the, mm -hmm. at the same time, it was like so normal. It was kind of mm -hmm. ridiculous. Like um, mm -hmm. um, until you leave. And yeah, and you realise how crazy yeah. it is. You know, um, I mean, there's one scene in the novel where um, where Cushla is on uh, Grafton Street, and she's got, she's kind of hovering in the doorway of of Switzers waiting for somebody to search her handbag. And when we moved to the south, um, I spent many uh, moments kind of hovering in doorways, thinking, "Are these people insane? Like, why is there no security?" And being laughed at. It's mm -hmm. like, sure, like, why would yeah, we have I security here? Well. I used to open my yeah. handbag and show it to people going yeah. to shops. And even things like um, I was in Gibneys in Malahide with my mm -hmm. um, with my sisters for a drink about um, it was before just before lockdown, and somebody had left a hold all under a table, and we were like calling the bouncers over saying, "Have you seen that bag? <laughs> it's gone. What's wrong with you?" Like, yeah, so there could be anything in it. Ridiculous. But you've been happy to go back to the north, haven't you? I mean, it, it seems to have been something that you needed to do. Yeah, although um, it's sort of weird because I think I cried a lot when I was writing it. There were just mm. uh, certain things because, I mean, it is, the stories are, um, uh, uh, I mean, the stories are complete fiction. Um, but the setting um, in the pub is, um, is completely drawn from what I can remember of what our pub looked like, uh, down to the banquettes and the the teak tables and the big um, baby shampoo that was behind mm -hmm. the bar that I was demented. They never gave it to me. Every time I went in, <laughs> I had to have lemonade in a baby sham glass. And um, uh, I also wanted baby sham and couldn't understand why something that looked um, like Bambi had booze in it, so they wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> and um, But the baby shampoo, I was like really keen to get to take it home, but I never did. Um, oh. But all of those things um, yeah. I remember very vividly. Um, you certainly, when you, you, you write about writing or you talk about writing like a, you, I think in one of the interviews that you did um, you said that sometimes when you were writing the novel you, you went into your shed and mm -hmm. looked at your computer and sort of felt like vomiting all over. Oh that'd be you, everything. You don't, you don't make it sound like a glamorous no. profession by any means. I know it's a lovely thing like I'm very lucky that um, like I did this um, when I was doing the PhD and writing the stories I had to do um, and I suppose when I was writing the first draft of the novel to an extent um, I had a, another job as well um, and sometimes that would be three or four days a week, but sometimes it would stretch to five. Mm. And, um, and also because I was having to travel to Queens, um, there was kind of extra time involved in that. So I'd have to just fit it all in around it. And I, I, don't, have, um, I don't have to have another job at the moment. Well, I'm sick at the moment, supposedly. I look really sick. Um, <laughs> um, and self medicate look like a white wine. Um, so, so I don't have another job at the moment, so, mm -hmm. um, w which is really lucky. But I'm like weirdly probably no more productive, which is... Well, you're spending a lot of time having treatment, aren't you? I mean, yeah. you're, you're actually going through a very serious illness. Yeah. Um, actually, you've talked about how that kind of focused your mind on yeah. being a writer. Can you t tell us a bit about that? Well, I think... Um, so I had, um, I went into my supervisor, Garrett Carr, um, when I was, he was my supervisor for the uh, creative part of the PhD in Queens. And um, I always felt, I don't know, I, I 
I did the MA and found it manageable. I wouldn't say that I found it easy. And then straight away I was like, I'm doing a PhD. And then within about six months, in about six weeks, I was going, what have I done? Because I didn't even have undergrad English and it all seemed very difficult. So I just kept trying to write the stories, but it meant that every time I had a meeting with him, um, I presented myself in his office, probably in a very alarming fashion, going, <laughs> what the fuck am I doing? Um, and he'd just laugh at me and uh, give me feedback on the stories and just tell me to keep going. And then one day he said, you know, maybe you should be trying to write a longer form thing. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. But I think most of the reason for that was to avoid writing up the essay on Nora Holt, mm -hmm. because um, I think it was maybe 50 hours before I submitted the PhD, um, after a big ranty, tearful phone call, Una told me what a footnote was, because I didn't even know, like it was very bad. <laughs> um, and it meant that I stayed up for like two nights crying and drinking tea, and um, I put on something like 272 footnotes, like <laughs> over, over a weekend, it was horrendous. Um, so yeah, it was all of that kind of stuff. But I think, but a lot of it was like a, a distraction. Mm -hmm. but, and so I had some notes um, uh, for, for the novel, like maybe about 10,000 words, and I'd been looking at like YouTube videos and kind of things around it. I don't know, just like, uh, and trying to remember things and, and looking them up. And I, I was reading um, other books as well. Like I read uh, your book, Bear in Mind, These Dead. And like Anna Byrne said that, that, um, that she spent a long time after she went to England uh, reading about the troubles, mm -hmm. just trying to figure out what it was. I think I've heard that other people have done that as well. Um, but then I think it was in, in March 2019 when I got the, the melanoma diagnosis in the first place, I, um, I was working in the library in Tupper Curry at the time and I'd had surgery. Um, so I had like a wound on my shoulder and a wound under my arm. And, um, and I, I knew I was gonna be off for quite a few weeks. And I, I did sit around for like a, a few days and binge watch things on um, TV and um, on Netflix. And then I just thought like, you might not have five years or 10 years or whatever to, to write a novel. So just stop talking about it and get on with it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually a total pleasure to be able to do that because um, because it just took me somewhere else completely. Mm -hmm. And it did give it an urgency. And even though the draft was absolutely dreadful, um, I think maybe some of that, like I, I think I tried, I made a deal with myself, I try and write like a thousand words a day. Um, and I didn't manage it every day, but most days I did. And it meant that within like three months, I had over 60,000 words. Um, and it was very bad, but it was something to work with. And I think that um, even though I had an awful job, actually the second draft was the hardest one to, was to try and like decide on the tenses and, and, and things like people's religions, which is absolutely ludicrous that uh, people have been changing religion in a, in a, in a story like that. Um, and, once, and so that took me probably about three months or four months to try and fix that up, maybe longer. Um, well, you talked, to, I remember you saying to me one day that you'd had to teach yourself to write a novel. Yeah. Oh, totally. Okay, so there's another thing that I did. So with the, I'd, I'd done the second draft, which was like to, um, to try and like fix up and make decisions about all of those things, about point of view and everything. And then um, at the very start of um, the first lockdown, in, so that would have been a full year later. And at that stage, the book had been bought by Bloomsbury, but all my editor had seen was like um, a fairly fixed up 10,000 words of it and a synopsis of something that um, um, I was thinking, I don't know if I can even write this thing. But anyway, it was submitted and she bought it. Um, yeah, I think of, you told me actually that your agent had said to you at one point, Louise, do you know what a chapter is? Oh yeah, but that was like <laughs> a week before it was submitted or something, because I thought I was great. I'd like fixed up 10,000 uh, words in the, in the river mill and sent it to Eleanor. And it was really like, it was just like 10,000 words. I hadn't tried to break it up into anything. Yeah, But she did say, what is it? yeah, do you know what a chapter is? And that was like very bad. That was like a week before <laughs> it was sent out to agents and stuff like that. So, um, so I fixed it up into, I think, four chapters. And um, I've had to like look things up and stuff online, which is really ridiculous. You know, what is a chapter? Yeah, you did. Google you... what is a chapter. I mean, how, do, how did you capture that 1970s thing from the sensibility of a young woman, considering that your memories of it were as a child, really? Okay, so my, um, so, so she won't mind me saying who it is, but so, and some of you probably met her. So I have an auntie, my dad's younger sister is called Fleur, and uh, she lived with us. Mm -hmm. um, for a while when I was a child. And so she's 11 years older than me. So she would have been, she would have been um, probably, yeah, so I guess that means that she was about 18 or 19 or something um, in the mid seventies. So uh, she, for example, did, you know, at one point um, in, the, in the first scene, the opening scene, Kush is wearing a pair of jeans with a patch on the pocket that says, push my panic button. And Fleur read it and she said, 
what was I thinking wearing a pair of trousers with that sewing <laughs> on the back pocket? And then, and then we remembered that when she lived with us, uh, that she, when she was walking up the stairs, I was about four or five, and I used to walk up behind her, poking the, poking the button, and she was going, get off. I was like, well, it says push it. Um, this sort of carry on. So a lot of the clothes would be hers. And um, yeah, there were sort of various details. So you were a true literal northerner. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you read us a little bit of, okay. the, of the novel? Um, is there any particular bit you want me to read, or will I just read Are the opening? You choose something. Maybe I'll read the opening scene, will I? Yeah. Okay. Um, my accent is probably getting more and more northern since I started talking to Susan, which is very embarrassing, actually, I have to say that. It's really embarrassing. So it's going to be completely uh, ridiculous here. I can't help it. I'm so sorry. It is mortifying. Um, I got slagged a lot when, um, when we moved. And, um, and within about two months, I just thought I can't walk around. Every time I opened my mouth, people were going, hi, now I'm Ryan Kai, except really badly. And it was complete hell and torture. And I was 12 and miserable. So I just thought, um, so I adapted this terrible... Um, Nace accent, which I hope has modified a bit. Anyway, I don't want a nice accent, whatever, but anything else. But uh, no harm to Nace, Jesus Christ. But, um, okay, sorry. <coughs> um, okay, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> I could go on. Um, Kushla wrapped her handbag in her coat and pushed it into the gap between the beer fridge and the till. Her brother Eamon was bent over the counter with a stock list. He looked up at her and his eyes narrowed. He inclined his head at the mirror that ran the length of the bar. Kushla leaned in to check her reflection. Father Slattery had marked her with a thick cross an inch wide and two inches long. The rub of her finger raised the piney resinous scent of whatever blessed unguent the ashes were mixed with and blurred the cruciate shape to a sooty smudge. Sorry, this happened the last time. There's too many S sounds on that, sorry. Um, Eamon slapped a wet serviette into her hand. Hurry up, he hissed. Most of the men who drank in the pub did not get ashes on Ash Wednesday or do the Stations of the Cross on Good Friday or go to Mass on Sunday. It was one thing to drink in a Catholic-owned bar, quite another to have your pint pulled by a woman smeared in papish war paint. Kushla buffed until the skin on her forehead was pink, the serviette blackened, flittered. She tossed it in the bin. Eamon muttered something under his breath. The only word she could make out was Egypt. The regulars were lined along the counter. Jimmy O'Kane, the single egg he bought for his tea, bulging in his breast pocket. Minty, the school caretaker, who got through so much Carlsberg special brew, the pub won an award for having the highest sales in Northern Ireland, even though he was the only customer who drank the stuff. Um, Fidel in his khaki cap and tinted glasses. By day, he measured mint imperials and clove rock in his mother's sweet shop. By night, he was brigadier of the local branch of the Ulster Defence Association. A fitter from the shipyard called Leslie, who didn't speak until he was drunk, and one night told Kushla he'd loved a bather. Another man, middle-aged, with a whiskey in front of him, dark-eyed, faintly jowly. He was wearing a black suit and a stiff white shirt from which the collar had been detached, clothes that were conspicuous among the overalls and drip-dry fabric. His hair was flat to the ears, then wavy at the nape of his neck, as if it had been sweating under a hat or a wig. Kushla climbed onto a stool to turn up the volume on the television. When she climbed down, the man with the whiskey was flicking at the filter of a cigarette with his thumb, as if he just looked away. The news started the way it always did, with a montage of short scenes. A riot. A boy of six or seven climbing up the side of a Saracen personnel carrier to poke a stone into one of the slits from which the soldiers pointed their guns. A march on Stormont, thousands moving up the long avenue to the Parliament building. They had added a new one. A single parked car on an empty street. It looked like a photograph until the car bulged and exploded into a great ball of smoke and fire and its doors somersaulted away from it, the glass from the surrounding buildings uh, falling like hail on the tarmac. The segment finished where it always did, on an image of Mary Peters holding up her Olympic medal. She won that three years ago, Eamon said. It's the last thing that happened here we can be proud of, said the man. His voice was deep, almost rough, despite his refined accent. Right enough, Michael, said Eamon. How did Eamon know his name? 
Vidal inclined his head at the newsreader. Barry's had the beard trimmed, he said, looping his own brush around his thumb and teasing it into a long tapered point. The news, a country road, a police Land Rover parked sideways across its white lines, a pair of legs draped in cloth protruding from a bald white thorn hedge. Men in balaclavas behind a Formica table, woolly faces pressed to a row of microphones lit sporadically by camera flashes. A pub with no windows, damp smoke wheezing from a crater in the roof. The last item on the news was a human interest story. Everybody liked this part because it was usually something non-partisan they could comment on. A reporter had been sent into the city centre to ask people what they thought of streaking. It's ridiculous, said a woman in a knitted hat. She's far too cold. <laughs> there were sniggers round the bar. A tiny man, slick with brill cream, said he'd do it if somebody paid him enough. The next man barked, it's obscene, and walked off. Then they stopped a girl with long dark hair and big eyes. She was wearing an Afghan coat, the collar fluffed up around her face. I think it's fantastic, she said, something different. She seems stoned. <laughs> she has the look of you about her, Kushla, said Minty. Would you be up for a bit of streaking yourself? Leave my sister alone, you pervert, said Eamon, smirking. Normally, Kushla would have had a reply that would shut them all up, but she was aware of the man with the neat whiskey and tidy nails. Thank you. So this is probably a very opportune moment to tell you that books will be on sale at the back of the room at the end of the, the evening with Aunt Louise will be signing them for you because I definitely feel that that's going to, anybody who hasn't already read it is going to now go and want, want to get it. <laughs> but I just want to, there's something you mentioned earlier on about Mills and Boone uh, books and you t then you, you, you introduce Michael in that in a way that, you know, you describe his voice as being deep and rough. Yes. I mean, we don't, there is, the sex in this book is not Mills and Boone. There is not sort of a, a pressing of manly chests to uh, <laughs> tight bodices, is, is, there, is there? I mean, there's a, it's, uh, it's fairly explicit and it's very, very much part of, of, the, of the story, isn't it? Like, this is not uh, a love story which is told primarily through eloquent language. It's a very, very physical, visceral story, isn't it? Mm. Um, I don't know what to say about that yet. <laughs> I guess it is. <laughs> I well, we just say it was deep and rough then, okay? <laughs> you can leave it at that if you want. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I mean, I guess I thought, I mean, I do see that as a, as a physical uh, mm. re uh, relationship, really, in, in lots of ways. Um, and maybe a lot of that is about the uh, kind of time factor where mm. um, they don't like get to see each other very often. So maybe, um, I don't know. And then also because they only really get to have that first kind of uh, rush, uh, which maybe some relationships, a lot of relationships are like mm. where people can't really walk around the place without thinking about <laughs> sex for the first few months. And then obviously if you run into them 25 years later, it's probably quite a different story. <laughs> but they only get to have the, um, the, the early Yeah, and, um, uh, that review that I mentioned that I really liked that Nicholas Allen wrote, he talked about um, was it the meaningful forms of the novel are made from the desires of the body and not the distractions of speech. And he, he talks about th how the experience of reading this novel is almost like having somebody beside you. And it is a very strange and powerful sensation that the, the novel makes on people, isn't it? And it, it makes it quite devastating when tragic things happen within the course of you see, it. I, I didn't really, like I didn't set out to, to do that. And I think that maybe is about me knowing my limitations. So you know the way some writers can um, do kind of internal monologue, write internal monologues for their characters that go mm. on for pages and pages. I, I couldn't possibly do that. And I think maybe um, the way that I could show um, characters is like how they're feeling in their bodies or how mm. they're responding to what's around them, whether that's, um, I don't know, air on their skin outside on a walk or, or just being near somebody they fancy or something, I don't know. Um, so, it so is something that you have in common with uh, Anna Burns, strangely, that kind of very physical atmosphere mm. that's there in the background all the time. In her novel, it's often fear. Yeah. Um, so mine's like lust or something, isn't it? <laughs> 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 Perhaps. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the use of language that you display there, I think it's, it's so refreshingly your own and, and unique. And I, I laughed out loud when I was, I was reading some of the reviews and interviews and things. And uh, I read an interview that you'd given to the London Times in which you told the interviewer that your pituitary gland was wankered. <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> and, and, wouldn't, and wouldn't be working again. And uh, the, the writer took it in good part and said, it was as if she was discussing a broken kettle. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say that there was plenty of Earl Grey tea spluttered in Kensington. Uh, she's nice. she's, actually, she's a lovely girl. She's from Banbridge, so she mm -hmm. kind of got it, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think we're going to go on to have another song from, from Cathy now. But just, but just before Cathy does, I'd just like to ask you to launch this magnificent book with a really good round of applause for Louise, because she really <laughs> to hand over to the amazing Cathy Jordan for another well, song. Uh, so, as I, I told you, Louise gave me a, um, a, play, a Spotify playlist uh, that is kind of a, has a, you know, associations with the, with the book. Um, so this is a song that wasn't in my repertoire before yesterday, um, but uh, is now. Uh, and it's important to Louise, um, with all the songs, there was one that stood out that had to be um, included, so this is it. Um, uh, so I hope I can um, do it justice.
That was absolutely beautiful, beautiful, Cathy. Thank you so much. It's, it's hard not to just sob. I know. Actually, isn't it? Um, that you? was like the most played record in our house, the Carpenters album. Do you remember mm. the brown cover? Mm -hmm. um, and the, it was like um, D Boss, is it called D Bossing? Or M Boss or something? The, yes. The logo yeah. on the front of it. Um, yeah, so I would have heard very many drunken renditions of that at various times. <laughs> and also because the line in the novel that I'm most proud of is fuck up, Karen. <laughs> Right, we're now going to have uh, some questions and answers uh, from the audience. So if anybody would like to, I think we have a microphone, haven't we? Yeah, so if you just put your hand up, please, so that we can get the, the mic to you. Any hands? Anybody want to ask anything or, or make any comments? Yes, here. Thank you. This is a very convoluted question, so bear with me. Okay. Um, something I noticed reading the book was that the character, as I think um, Susan said, like the character is so close that you're physically sort of embodying her. And I noticed sort of towards the end suddenly that I had no real sense of what she looked like. And I think that's because of that closeness. Um, and I think it works brilliantly. That's not a criticism. Um, but I'm wondering if you have an image of her because... Um, yeah, I, I have my own image. I realise there's no indication in the text. It's just my own from being in her body during reading, if you see what I mean. Uh, do, do I know what she looks like? Could they? Yeah. Yeah, I think I have much less sense of what she looks like than what everybody else looks like yeah, because exactly. it's That's her the reading. Or something, which yeah, is that's really exactly weird. what it's like. I didn't read. have any. Yeah, uh, yeah I, like I don't. I don't know what colour her hair is, and I don't know what her face is like. I yeah. just that sounds insane. But I know what all the others look. Everybody else looks like. I wonder, does that contribute to that closeness? You know, that you really embed in her perspective. Yeah, it might be. Like, um, I, like in the very first draft, <laughs> I did write a lot of the first drafts in the second person, um, w w which was like that's not sustainable at all. It's like madness, really. Um, um, and I had to fix that. And also, it's a very limited point of view, um, and, and too intense for like a big long, um, for a long piece of work. I think. Well, I, certainly, I couldn't pull it off in a long piece of work. Um, and it meant then that when I went back and changed it, I think a lot of that intimacy stayed there or something, that it was very much in her body and in her head. So it was that kind of second person, yeah. that northern But then it meant person. that in, in subsequent drafts, I was able to do what you can only do really in the third person, which is, you can do anything in the third person, it's just so brilliant. Like you can, you know, you can zoom way out and, you, I don't know, you can throw things in for context or, um, you, you know, like that uh, that bit about the powers would be quite difficult to do in the first or the second yeah. person, but yeah. you can do anything you like in the third person. You know, once you say she, um, so I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's wh what the reason for that was. Does it is it been you? I think it just when works speaking to herself. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, or maybe. I mean, it is just so close. Yeah, it, it wasn't really. I wasn't asking why. I was just wondering. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if she knew what she looked like. Um, no need to get defensive. I know. Yeah, like, <laughs> no, what are you saying, Elsa? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I think it's a very fair observation, and, and it is. You do stay very close to her, don't you? And you see her commenting on herself quite a bit in a very funny way throughout throughout the book. Like mm. uh, she'll say, you know, what sort of a person is she? That you know, she's making dinner for her mother, and and this man phones, and uh, she immediately drops everything mm. and, and and goes to be with him. Mm -hmm. But she seems sort of powerless not to do that. At the same time, as she's critical of herself mm -hmm. for doing that. She she's caught in this thing. Yeah, well, I, guess, I don't know. I mean, people are kind of conflicted all the time, mm. aren't they, in what they're doing? And then I think maybe conflict is um, the thing that's really at the heart of fiction. Mm. Like, if I had, um, had a fella of about 29 or 30 walking into the bar who was another female and t taught him, like, a, I don't know, St. Patrick's single with a good or something. Job. <laughs> single with a good job, exactly. Um, um, you know, who was starting, just taking up golf. Um, it would have been about half a chapter of love. Yeah. You know. I'm not a very good No, she would not be reading that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? Um, yeah, hi. I'm a little bit starstruck because I did a presentation for Una's class on you. And then I was a little bit obsessed with your work then. Oh, right. I was like, well, I have to come tonight you. because I loved your work so much. And my question is, it's not really about your new book, it's about In Silhouette. Um, what I was really interested in was that In Silhouette was in second person. and. All of your other books it was so it was so different to all of the other stories and i just wondered why you chose to sort of mark it so different in second person and to the time slips as well were something that really set it apart 
So I was just wondering why you chose to mm -hmm. make such different distinctions between that and the rest of the story. Okay, that's a really good question. So the reason for that is that I didn't set out to write in silhouette, whereas with uh, each of the other stories in the collection, I had um, some sort of, a, I, sometimes it might have been something like, um, you know, in Hunter Gatherers, I was working, I knew there was going to be a hair and a, and a really not, a not very great um, boyfriend kind of thing happening. But, but I knew I was working towards a last line. Like I knew the last line before I knew what was going to have to happen to get there. You know, that line, um, it, or what was it, his hand smelled like slaughter or something. Um, and, the, so th and the other stories, maybe there was something else. Um, but I, I set out to do something with each of the other with each of the other stories. But in silhouette came out of um, uh, I was trying to write a story that became sparing the heather, and um, I I couldn't I had a, a setting I suppose and a, a place and I knew there was a body somewhere and I knew there was a woman who was very unhappily married, um, and. But I didn't know where, to, what is it, Claire Keegan calls it that, uh, is it the incision in time or something? I, I couldn't figure out where to, to, um, to kind of cut in and start it. Um, so I tried all kinds of different things. And this is like the story that ended up up at about 43,000 words or something. So I tried different points of view, all kinds of different things. And then one day, um, I, um, in complete desperation, it was like really early in the morning, and I um, started to try and write a flashback um, for, for uh, that character, uh, Maraid, in, uh, in, in silhouette and my idea was uh, it was like her as a, as a young woman and I wrote it from the point of view of you know the second person so it was like her speaking to herself and calling herself you and I started to type and thought okay I should have no idea what I'm doing here I've never tried the second person in my life and um, but I just kept going and um, uh, so I wrote that one kind of vignette I guess it was um, which is pretty much the opening section of um, in silhouette and then um, I parked it, and I think I had other things to do, and I managed to get it, avoid doing them and, and got back at, at it again. And um, I wrote that story so quickly, like so quickly. But, um, and, and I don't know where I came on this, the, the structural thing, because what it is is, um, I mean, I guess there's that event that happened on a night when that girl's 17 or 18, and then it's cut through with scenes from later when she's trying to get away. But each of the later scenes has a character from that night in there, Usually your man, um, uh, what's his name, Winky, is it? Yeah, in most of the scenes, um, or her, her brother. Um, um, is it Payday? Yeah, so yeah. I think that's what, that's, it was an accident, basically. That, and, <laughs> and it also seemed really bonkers, and I just held my nerve. And I think there's maybe a lesson in that or something, that, um, that a lot of it is just about trusting the process or something, and, um, and, and keeping going even when it feels mental, so, yeah. <laughs> So we'll maybe take one more question, if there is one. There's a hand up at the back there. Hi, Louise. Uh, thank you. Thank it's you, it's such a terrific book, it really is. Thank um, you. One thing that struck me, as you were describing point of view, that the third person is good because you can zoom out. Yeah. I found the book very filmic. I mean, lots and lots of film references, which I loved. It really captured a, a period of time without you actually saying what the period of yeah. time was. Um, and it made me think that at the end, it is a very filmic kind of writing. Is, is that a big influence in your work more than literature, say? Um, yeah, I'd say at least as much as anything else, yeah. Um, like I had, um, I, th I, I probably had 10 years when I didn't read any fiction. As an adult, like when my kids were small and everything, I could read non-fiction, but I couldn't read any fiction. And I guess any story that I was taking in, I mean, we take in story in all kinds of ways. Um, but yeah, I think I probably took in um, uh, story in, in film and TV as much as anything else. Yeah. Do you think that the book will be made into a, 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 a drama or well, a film? Might. Well, so, might be. <laughs> well, somebody optioned it, and um, so things are being done with it. Yeah. Hopefully so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you seem to have a tremendous amount of support uh, from a writing community here in Sligo and also from a writing community in Belfast, as well as having a huge amount of people who just really like you and love you. Um, is that true of Sligo, that there is a, a really good sort of ambience for writing at the moment with a lot of other good writers around? It certainly seems that way. Yeah, it seems um, to be alive. Yeah, so I'm just yeah, looking around the room. So the, um, I, I, I stopped going to the writing group that we were in, but you're all still going, I think, are you? No? 
I don't know, maybe not. Um, I don't know. <laughs> but um, and then they're writing a literature program that um, that um, Una um, set up in the in the IT and stuff. So there mm. is like a, a community. And then um, like I still share. I don't know. I mean, I I, I was very uh, uh, privileged to read like a. Um, uh, a proof of Alice's book and um, and and read Una's drafts and stuff along the way and um, so yeah I don't know I guess there is a, a community yeah yeah it's it's very attractive you know compared with the sense that there used to be maybe a decade or more ago of a of quite a male dominated group of writers who yeah. were very competitive and cutthroat yeah it just doesn't seem to be that way no anymore. it's not like that and I don't know I mean I've certainly found it um, that well just um, in, in, I suppose in terms of Ireland in general that. Um, uh, that I, I've had a lot of help from um, uh, from people like um, like Sinead Gleeson has helped me, um, Liz Nugent has helped me, Marion Keyes has helped me. Do you know what I mean? Even for somebody to take the time and blurb your book um, is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, for you to have, have read that proof with things that I couldn't, um, do you know, there were things that I couldn't look up. And also, um, I, I suppose I, my biggest fear about the book was that um, people would say, like, you know, what right do you have to be writing this? Because I just sound so southern and everything. Um, and I think I needed to have, a, um, like, a, a Nordy a female um, a gaze um, as well. So it was really brilliant that you did that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that it probably is very supportive. Yeah. Well, that's, that's all good. And a good note on which to finish, I think, as well, of this section of the evening. So just before, we're going to have another song from... Uh, Kathy shortly and then after that we'll have the open mic section but uh, just before that I just want to thank Louise enormously for being so generous with what she's talked to us no, about well, tonight. Thank you very much and for everything. And saying thanks, so much about your work. And, and, and thanks and to the library for having me as well. Yeah, <laughs> and thanks to the library too. Thanks. Thanks, 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 thanks. And, and thanks so much to The Word for hosting these amazing sessions. And thanks to everybody at the library who's made all this possible. And thanks especially, I think, to Cathy, who has really given this a, a, a really wonderful soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So Yay. thank you, Cathy. Last one? Yes. Oh, yeah. uh, if you know this one, help. <laughs> <laughs>
keeps me searching for a heart of gold Keeps me searching and I'm going on Keeps me searching for a heart of gold Been a miner for a heart of gold And I'm getting old Good evening, everybody. Hello, Tony. I just recognised you from Zoom. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, former student alert. Sorry. Sorry, that was a bit impulsive. Sorry, just two short poems, and I won't keep you a minute now. Um, the first one is called Trust More. From Trustmore to Ben Bulban's snowy back and round to the blade of Ben Whiskin, the hillside sweeps. The sun shines on the crookedy road, a golden liquid river. Sheep turn their backs to me, red and blue splashes and white across the green. Imperious mass shoots up off the mountaintop, space rocket on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. Low, stunted, twisted tree leaning from the waist, its puff of branches extending into the gale that it cannot block, a lonely supplicant to God. Bubbling stream unseen below the boggy bank and the black stones of a ruined home where a forgotten family once huddled before America beckoned or a coffin ship. Brown fences, almost green, lean in crooked lines about the valley and ditches fill with muck and water like Rat's Alley, visions of the Somme. Dark green battalion of conifer marches to join a larger column slanting towards the summit, awaiting the order to advance or retreat perhaps. Grey clouds above the bowl blow toward the coast at Cliffinier Streeter, shooed by bossy gusts. Okay. And the second one then is, um, it's called Black Sheep. It's about a sheep. <laughs> Hairy black sheep with the black and white face. You look a bit like a badger in a great coat. Why do you sit on the wet grass looking down the slope, ignoring your friends? You don't look comfortable. Turn to the flock munching happily behind you, 20 feet away, on the clumps that jut from the sward, cutting green drool at the sides of their mouths, farting methane to the heavens. But you ignore them. Too refined, too haughty, too detached, not talking, not a team player. Is the wool of your arse caked? Are you sitting in your own mess like the old man in a nursing home, abandoned, disliked, ashamed to go to the refectory with the others? Next up we have Audrey Robinson. Before I start, can I just congratulate Louise on behalf of all the um, year two online students. Louise was our very first tutor for the first term, and uh, the best piece of advice she gave us was, fuck the exams, just do the writing. <laughs> <laughs> and Sorry. I don't have my glasses, so <laughs> here's open. Um, so two short bones as well. Uh, this is waiting for a cuppa. Is it drink or blood pressure? that made his face ruddy, above the faded shirt and skew if tie that he wore to town, with his good leather shoes and farmer's suit smelling of cow shit and piss. Afraid to move in case someone takes his seat, he fumbles the money in his pocket, swinging his legs like a child on a chair plane, and sends a fresh puff of ammonia scented air in our direction. The nurse opens the door, he darts into the ER, she returns him smartly. You must sit in the waiting room. I've been waiting ages for a cup of tea. I know, but this is the emergency room. Well, I don't know what it is. He mutters her away. I hear, feck it anyway, and the odd bastard. They don't have enough staff. They need more staff. 
A girl comes in and is given crutches. If they'd only stop coming in altogether, you would want to bring your dinner with you and your supper along with it. Jesus, I'm parched. I must be five hours since I got here. The nurse calls him and he goes with her to see the doctor who will no, no doubt recoil from the cow shit and piss and give him a diagnosis when all he wants is a cup of tea. <laughs> on the day the Russian tanks entered the Ukraine. The sea is monstrous. Verticals of glass green water, burdened by their own weight, fall in furious eruptions against the sand. Among the tumult, three dots of color, windsurfers confront the threatening seas. One has beached dangerously close to the rocks, a splash of yellow on the beige sandbank. He wades out, sail flapping like a wounded wing, till he catches the wind and breaches the breakers. His friend, seal-like in neoprene, stands next to me watching. Is he okay? He's a long way out. Oh yes, comes the answer. That's where we're going, where the real waves are. Above the uproar, a gull buffeted in the wind sends a shrill cry to be torn to shreds in the teeth of the gale. Um, hello, uh, this is uh, Victoria Station. From one angle, you might say woman. From another, I am a boy, too young to be on his own. I use that to my advantage sometimes. Tuck my mask firmly over my nose and look a little lost, a little scared. Not that it takes much pretending. I queue for a cubicle focusing on not catching anyone's eye, but with mirrors surrounding us and men everywhere, it's hard. I was nervous before I entered. Crashing face first into a biker in full leathers wasn't part of the plan. He scared me at the time, imposing even without being a good head taller. But now I wonder, could he be like me, seeking solace in the anonymity of his helmet, the same way I was glad for the thin mask over my mouth? Bridget McMurra. Hi, I wrote this on the last bus back from Donegal Town. Log one, 7.55 bus to Sligo. When I tell you I am breaking, do not tell me to be thankful. Do not tell me to be grateful for the oxygen in my lungs when it burns like smoke fumes. Don't mention the sun on my face when it feels like it's charring my skeleton. I don't want to hear about the wind blowing through my hair because I feel weightless and drifting. Do not tell me I should be thankful for being alive when I'm not sure my heart's even beating. I wash the ashes out of my hair every Monday night and sit on the floor under the spray for hours. On Wednesday, I scrub my skin pink and raw, try to scrub away everything I can't handle. I just end up watching the blood mix with soapy water all the way down the drain. I'm telling you my heart is cracked and how I was never good at puzzles, mismatched shapes trying to slot back together. You're telling me to enjoy crippling boredom and learn new hobbies. I'm crying about eyes in the walls, blinking with the steady increase of my heartbeat and you're saying I need to get a job to get out of my own head. I am bitter and vengeful and would rather burn myself alive then hash out family drama, you disapprove of every minute choice I make. And I'm still fighting for your love and affection. Maybe I'm already burning. And finally, we have Linda Norton. So Louise is so fucking funny, and uh, never met her before, but like all her 12,000 followers, I feel like I know her very well. I spent two years reciting Louise's tweets to my daughter and saying, she's so funny. Um, so in honor of Louise's incredibly steamy novel, 
Like, I didn't even know you could do that with a gusset. <laughs> Maybe gusset's different in America. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> or it will be in November when the books come out there. So, yeah, that scene, she's like, she went and met Michael for 40 minutes. And I was like, and then she moves into the next paragraph. And I'm like, wait, wait, that must have been hot. Oh, yeah. Then the gusset comes into the description. So read it just for craft reasons. Um, so I don't ever read any sex stuff from my two books, but because of Louise, I'm reading this. Uh, it's a poem, I'm reading two poems. This one's called Trinity, and a friend of mine, Joe Donahue, shared, a great poet in America, shared an Easter poem of his that was a bit perverse, so I shared this one too. Trinity. First the father came in my eye, then the son came in me, so I smelled gamey. Like the tree that grows out of junk in empty lots on 10th Street, tree of heaven. I remember when that smell of semen came in through barred windows at parties in summertime, and we laughed. Now your ghost comes in my ear every night you're here. When they come in you, they are one. They come together in a groan. God, spirit, man, splitting you. That's how they make sense. Those medallions of bone, one has a core of steel and pencil lead, one is rich with marrow, and the third is hollowed out. So light and empty, it's always and everywhere. And these various bones are looped together with a bloody ribbon that has no end and no beginning. And then the other one is Um, the other one, I would love to teach a course. I teach at IT Sligo, um, which is my good luck to have the chance, and I do it from my desk in California. And I come to Ireland a lot, but because of the pandemic, I haven't been here in a while, and I'm so happy to be back. Um, and I could teach a course just on threes in literature, trinities and many other things. Um, Self-portrait as a meadow. There is a chair, the heart of which is wooden, split five ways, and grass pressed flat where we kissed, where others later kissed on the same mattress, and solemn nothing happening under a canopy. Have you forgotten me? I will go down wonderfully, as was told in Proverbs, though for a long time I thought I should not go. Here are things that have no Latin names, or none that men would know. Thank you. Hi, Evan. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's been an absolutely fabulous evening. It's been such a privilege to me be amongst these amazing women, the brilliant, the brilliant Susan McKay, the fantastic and beautifully sounding Cathy Jordan, and the woman of the evening, Louise Kennedy. Um, we got to work with Louise Kennedy for a few years when she was here in Sligo Library and she was so, full of so much joy and laughter and conversation. And yeah, I think you got a sense of that this evening from her and you get a sense of it from her books. And I think that's why you're so successful because you're just so popular with everyone, your friends and who you work with and everything. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you to those online. Um, thank you to the BA in Creative in Writing and Literature. Um, they are doing their own launch on Friday evening. They're launching a new journal called the um, Scrimshaw Journal of New Writing and Visual Art. So that's on Friday evening in um, ATU Sligo. Um, I just want to thank um, Studio Robe as well for always being our support on, for the Word and just being great support, technical support this evening. And um, our next edition of the Word will be on the 25th of May. And if you want to find out more details for that, you can leave your contact details at the desk. And um, Libra will be selling copies of Louise Kennedy's new book at the back of the room. And Louise will be signing copies here at the, at the side of the room. And um, I think that's it. Thanks a million, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.